We're the Grandparents Raising Grandchildren Information Center of Louisiana. And we were formed because grandparents found that they were raising their grandchildren and they needed resources. So they started having uh, small group meetings. Small group meetings led to the creation of the Grandparents Raising Grandchildren Information Center, a nonprofit, and also led to conferences and support groups, monthly support groups. So this is our 13th annual conference. This organization got started when I got my grandson to raise when he was 12 and a half, and I found myself looking for resources, uh, looking all around, wondering what am I going to do, how am I going to get some help. So I spoke to um, a friend of mine who was uh, at the Council on Aging, went up there, met Dana, and we started a small support group. We put a little ad in the paper, and people came. And from that little support group, it's now grown to be a 501c3. There are many, many issues that they face. One of them, the primary issues, is custody. That's always been a big problem to get custody because if you don't have custody there are a lot of things you can't take advantage of like uh, insurance and medical care and dealing with schools and all that they're not supposed to deal with the people who don't have custody we are third in the country with the number of grandparents raising grandchildren um, we're behind Mississippi and Hawaii uh, but Louisiana has quite a few grandparents raising grandchildren. In fact, the highest number of grandparents raising grandchildren uh, can be found in Webster Parish. I'm not sure if I really could have handled my grandchildren coming back to live with us like they have with y'all. You're starting all over again. And I think, what greater gift is there that someone gives up their life for another? and that's what you are doing. You're giving up your lives, no matter how much you love those children, you're giving up the times when you could be sitting on that beach sunbathing by yourself to be taking care of those children with all the problems and all the difficulties that come about. So I'm hoping that today with all the wonderful speakers and the, the encouragement from other people that are here just like you, that you'll leave the day feeling better, you'll have a little more energy, you'll feel a little bit more like you can tackle those problems when you go back home. You may never have a ticker tape parade in your honor. You may not even get the 15 minutes of fame that we are all supposed to get. You may not even have the undying love of your grandchildren for a while because when they get to a certain age, just like your children, they know they know more than you do. So <laughs> but in the end, I believe that you will have the undying respect of all of us that have been through some of this and know what you're going through. You will have our respect and our love, and I hope that God will bless you all greatly. Thank you. There are lots of challenges, and I, you know, I'm speaking to you, but you could probably tell me better than I can suggest to you. There are lots of challenges that go along with parenting a second time around. There, um, you know, you've got your own health to, to, to deal with, and you know, sometimes the resources provide the biggest challenge in terms of taking care of your own needs and, and not only your own needs, but the children's needs. And so you can, you know, you've worked your entire life to build your own retirement, and you may have to. Uh, redirect some of those uh, investments and resources to, to caring for the child. There are physical demands, getting up and going, um, chasing after the little rugrats or whatever the, the case may be. And often in doing so, your own medical needs are, uh, are, are neglected. And this is just U.S. statistics. There are about a million, a little over a million heart attacks each year and about half of those people will die. And this is a tremendous burden on our health care system, about fifty billion dollars worth of, of care goes to just caring for heart attacks. And so just uh, uh, we'll give you a little education, heart attacks uh, occur and we call that coronary artery disease and we're going to show you what the coronaries sort of look like in, in a slide or two. And just by definition a heart attack is when part of the heart muscle is damaged or is, is permanently uh, uh, I kind of call it scar tissue, but if there's death or damage to a part of the heart muscle, and when, it, it typically occurs when one of these arteries, one of the coronary arteries, gets plugged up with plaque and cholesterol. 
The message is to recognize that heart disease is the greatest risk to your health. Heart disease is the number one killer in this country. It's the number one killer of grandparents here in this state. And that fortunately many of the risk factors for heart disease are modifiable and I'd recommend that those of you at risk should see your health care provider to uh, get further testing. In a nutshell, what are the, uh, the symptoms of heart attack and what should people do uh, if they experience those? Typically the symptoms are chest discomfort, usually pressure, heaviness, or tightness in the center of the chest that may radiate to the jaw or the neck or back. Um, if you think you're having a heart attack, you should take an aspirin right away and also call 911 to get help because time is muscle. My brother uh, died of colon cancer that spread to his liver. Uh, my mother died of a, of a heart attack at 51. My brother was 42 when he died. And then uh, my grandmother died from the end stages of diabetes. And so all of that is floating around, but doctor, I have to tell you with this job here, I have to take blood pressure medicine. <laughs> we have cases all the times where um, we have individuals traveling across the country, state to state, accessing our kids here and, and preying on our children here, as well as individuals from inside the state preying on our children here as well. Now Casey Renee Woolley, she met this guy in the bottom right corner. This is David. David's is an All-American star football player. He's the high school sweetheart. Everybody loves David. Over the course of a year and a half, they begin talking, and she watches David grow up. She knows David's a real person because she's seen the news clippings about David, how he's going to be the next star quarterback in the area. He's sending her the high school prom pictures and the homecoming pictures, talking about all the girlfriends and boyfriends and stuff that's going on. So they grow up. They know each other. Well, at this point in time, Casey divulges some information she probably shouldn't have. She felt comfortable, and she said, I'm just really sad today. My mom died in a car wreck, and it's just really, it's really bothering me. Well, what do you think his response was? I know exactly what you're feeling. My aunt was just in a car wreck. Now, she's in a coma. She didn't die, but I know exactly what you're feeling. And so instantly, that bond, that connection became a little bit stronger. Casey found somebody that she could truly relate to and who understood her. So later on, about six months later, she gives some more information, which ends up being some very fatal information. She says, not even realizing it, I get home from school first. My brother gets home about a half hour after I do, and I don't know when my dad gets home because he's a police officer and works crazy shift work. So you can see the slide. You can see the top portion. You know where this is going next. Casey's brother gets home one day and doesn't find Casey there. Casey's always home, so he knows something's wrong. He immediately calls Dad and said, Dad, something's wrong. Casey's not here. Dad calls all of his police buddies. They search the whole town, everywhere. Can't find Casey anywhere. Several hours later, after not being able to find Casey, they called the FBI in. The very first thing the FBI did was go sit down at her computer. They started looking at her computer, and they realized that Casey's been talking to David. But this is the David that Casey's been talking to. This David is a San Diego man who rents a U-Haul truck in San Diego, drives to the small town in Arizona where he, I'm sorry, in, in uh, Arkansas where he abducts Casey. The story gets incredibly gruesome from here, so I'm going to spare you a lot of the details. But over the course of the next seven days, they travel back to San Diego. Each of the nights, they stay in a hotel where horrible things happen. The FBI finally tracks them back to a self-storage unit, like one of those storage pod areas where the van's located. The SWAT team comes rushing in to save Casey, and they hear a single gunshot. They find out that David's taken his own life. Okay. Problem is, prior to that, he also took Casey's life. Now, we tell you this story for three main reasons. Number one is that predators and bad guys online will use any bit of information whatsoever to gain access to you and your kids. In this case, it was the death of her mother. That's what that bonding factor was. The next thing is that unless you know somebody in real life, you really don't know somebody. I do a similar presentation at all the high schools and middle schools in the area. And we've probably talked about 180,000 kids so far this year. Every single time I talk to kids at school, it becomes a game. How many friends do you have on Facebook? How many friends do you have on MySpace? Well, I got 287. I got 473. And somewhere in that group, somebody comes out with, I got 1,340 something. Guys, I've been around a little while. We've all been around a little while. I know for a fact that in my life, after being around for a while, I don't know 1,000 people I would consider friends. So we did a little test. We did a little survey. 
and I created a profile that said nothing more than John Doe. That was my name, was John Doe. No pictures, no description, no nothing. And I sent it out to 100 kids in this area. Out of those 100 kids, how many of you think accepted me as a friend? Almost all of them. 94 of them simply because I asked them to, with nothing else more. Next one is that absolutely anybody is vulnerable. Remember, her dad was a police officer. Probably had all those wonderful talks. Hey, be careful. Don't, don't talk online to strangers. But she felt comfortable with that David because she knew he was a real person. Come to find out, the David she was talking to was this man. However, the persona that he was using was his nephew. He was using his nephew's pictures and his nephew's stories and his nephew's everything to gain access to this child. Uh, unfortunately, this is probably one of the largest unknown crimes that's out there. We have roughly 5,000 cases a month on average in the state of Louisiana that um, most people don't even realize exist. So, I mean, it, it can be any walk of life as far as any person, any child. Um, and these predators are using everything from video games to the internet to cell phones to access our kids. What tips do you have for parents to be able to safeguard their children on the internet? They definitely need to be completely involved in these kids' lives and understand what the kids are doing online and set some decent rules and guidelines for these kids to, to follow their expectations these kids have. If people have questions or like more information, what should they do? They can contact the Attorney General's office. And our number is area code 225-326-6100 and we're the High Tech Crime Unit. We'd like for the legislature to be sensitive to the needs of the grandparents uh, and to remember that when a grandparent takes a grandchild into their house, to keep them from becoming a ward of the state, the state saves money. If the grandparent would not take that child into the house, then that child would become a ward of the state and the state would have to spend money on those children. Uh, we are thankful for a subsidy that grandparents get if they qualify, uh, but we would like to see changes in the subsidy. They've helped us a whole lot already. We would really like to see the, a thing that's called de facto parenting, where grandparents can get custody by proving that they've take, cared for the child for a certain period of time without having to go through court to get custody. That's our biggest dream right now. We face a lot of legal issues. Legal is probably our biggest problem because as grandparents raising grandchildren, we don't know what we can do, what we cannot do. We don't know where to turn for help. So I would say legal. What would you like to see happen in this session of the legislature to assist grandparents? I would like to see them change some of the laws uh, that govern the uh, programs that we could get some assistance from and I would like to see them redefine family because family today is not just mom, dad, brother, sister. It includes uh, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, what they like to call the homeless children and when we take them in they're not categorized as family. So I'd like to see that definition changed. In the last legislative session, the Louisiana State Legislature started a council on the status of grandparents raising grandchildren in Louisiana. And as someone who works with the state's child welfare department, I realize how critical it is for us to support families and have families who are willing to step forward and help their children when families are in crisis. It makes a much more stable placement for children when they're able to remain within their family of origin. It makes it much easier for them to cope with the trauma of the abuse and neglect that they've experienced. And so we're really optimistic about the potential of the Council on the Status of Grandparents Raising Grandchildren and that it brings together so many government entities and other nonprofit agencies that work with families in the state of Louisiana and gives us an opportunity to collaborate with one another and finding ways to educate the public on the impact it has on families raising grandchildren as well as to find ways to work better together to support those families and those grandparents as they struggle with juggling their finances and the family relationships and all those other issues that impact their capacity to care for those children. So it's an exciting time in Louisiana to see us having this opportunity to come together and have that supported by our legislature. Keep in mind that we should be very thankful for the effort that our seniors make, especially our grandparents raising grandchildren. 
keep in mind that we need their support in order to get some issues taken care of and we'd like to see more support groups across the state where grandparents can come and get some help. They need to start support groups around the state for, to help other grandparents because there are a lot more around there than you get to our conference every year. That's one of our main goals. If they have questions, uh, they can go to our website, which is www.lagrg, and they will find uh, our phone number and contact information. Or they can dial 225 767-3123.